church, if you have your Bibles or a copy of God's Word, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to find verse 10. This morning we're going to be talking about, um, just before we get into our baptisms, we're going to be talking about soul winning. And um, we're going to be looking at uh, the plan of salvation this morning. Um, We touch on this about once a year, but I want to touch on it this morning because I know that uh, as we were going through several new members um, this year, going through the new beginnings class, new membership class, is that basically if you come down to it and the closest person to you in life, um, if it determined on whether or not they went to heaven or not based on what your knowledge is. Um, see, I think it's great that there's people in here who can work on cars. I think that's an excellent thing. God's given that. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, that can get you to church. You know what I'm saying? I, I think it's good that people know how to work on people in hospitals and stuff. I think that's good. That can keep them alive to get back to church. Um, I think it's a good thing that people know how to cook food and everything. That gives us strength and food to be able to get back to church. Um, I think it's good to have those things. But at the same time, we need to be able to be able to do those kind of things and be able to know how to lead somebody to Christ. How, you know, it's like today. <clears throat> you know how sometimes when you walk up with people and um, you don't know who's standing with them. You know, they tell me the polite thing to do is um, introduce the person that you're standing with and perhaps the one that walks up. Y'all ever heard of that? They say that's pretty. That's a pretty good thing to do. Say, oh, by the way, hey, you know so and so, and you introduce them. You know that kind of thing. Man, there's been a lot of times in my life I didn't introduce. I'm like, hey, so and so, hold on a minute. Hey, so and so, hold on a minute. And just talk, but I, but I haven't introduced them. I haven't connected them. I haven't got them together. Uh, it, it certainly makes you feel a little bit more at ease when you meet somebody, you talk to somebody. That's a good thing. Um, but it's the same way with you having Christ, you being hid in Christ, your life in Christ, and you knowing Christ, and then you're able to introduce the people that come into your life to Jesus Christ, whom is already in your life. So you pair the two up, you introduce them. And how would you actually introduce them? So my thing is, a lot of the time is, you can sit there and when you're talking to somebody, now here's, well, here's a tough spot, Ready? You're talking to somebody you had not talked to in a while. You know their name, but you just can't call it right now. Somebody walks up, and you know their name, and you wish that you knew their name. So how in the world are you going to introduce these two without showing yourself? You know what I'm saying? So that's when you have an imaginary vibration on your phone and say, hey, y'all get to know one another for a minute. I'm going to take this call. You know, it just, they just, you try to get out of the spot, but the problem is you don't know how to be polite. You don't know how to be Christian because you don't know their name, you know? And, uh, and, I, and we just kind of touched on that this morning. Now, that is why God put in, you know, brother and sister, you know what I'm saying? To show family and to cover our slack when we can't remember nobody's name, you know what I mean? And uh, so anyway, that's a, that's a tough spot to be able to do that. Now, this morning, you say you know Jesus. Do you think you know Jesus, or do you know Jesus? Yeah, I know we say, we say that figuratively. Some people say, man, they need some Jesus in their life. They some people that need the whole trinity. <laughs> Amen? Y'all believe that? They need the whole trinity. Um, they, but they need all of God in their life, for sure, for sure. Um, this morning, you think about this for a moment. <clears throat> when you think about salvation this morning are you glad you're saved amen would would your face this morning be an indication of your joy of salvation would would that be thank god he didn't say the face was the window of our soul it's your eyes amen god knew what he was doing i think he started out with face and he said "Mm, we better rethink that one no, 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 that wouldn't be a good image of your soul. No, 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 no. But, but maybe your eyes, you know, because it's the smallest features on your face. So God's like, we've got to narrow this down. But, but, but what happens is, is it's a shame that you can say you're a Christian and you look like you're going to hell. That's terrible. And I'm sorry, Jesus, that we do that to you. I'm sorry that your cross and your blood and your resurrection wasn't enough to make us smile. 
God, I'm sorry. On behalf of us, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that it's not enough. Lord, I'm sorry that your cross is not greater than my bed. God, I'm sorry that your cross is not greater than my pain. God, I'm sorry that what you did ain't good enough or powerful enough or greater than what I'm dealing with. I'm sorry. God, I may have to look somewhere else other than you to find something to smile about. God, I may have to look for something else other than you to have something to brag about. Winning souls is not just about an image or a look. But I will tell you this. Sometimes the outside of your house can be a very good image of what it looks like inside your house. That's a fact. There ain't nobody um, going to just take care of one thing. If you take care of business, you take care of business. And you have to understand that in this winning, winning souls is important. Now, now, remember this. I saw this, and this is really good. I love the plan of salvation, but I love more the man of salvation. The man of salvation. And so this morning, we don't want to lose focus of that because without the man, we can't have the plan. All right? And without the plan, we can't introduce them to the man. And so we understand this morning. See, I, I, I know it would take a miracle this morning, right? But God's in the miracle-making business. But there's a possibility this morning, if you mess around this morning and let God in a little bit, he might mess around and bounce you out of here this morning. You'd be looking for somebody to win to Jesus. If you ain't careful, I'm serious. And you know what? And you might just walk out of here this morning smiling. I ain't kidding. I ain't kidding. Amen. Look here. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, they, they, you know I like food, right? Food makes me smile. I ain't kidding. I see me some good food. I'm going to tell you I light up. Man, I light up. That's some good stuff right there. I do. But I'm going to tell you this morning. When Jesus walks into the room, that'll make you light up. Hey, I'm telling you, man, it'll just fire you up, light you up. It'll bring something to your life. And so... This morning, <clears throat> always know this here. When we go out and we win souls, how many of y'all, anybody got a rechargeable flashlight in here, a stream light, mag light, some kind of something light? Any, y'all got something like that? Maybe just say amen. Hey, you ever notice you use that thing a little while and you don't put it back on charge? Will it work? But you know what I have learned about them stream lights? Even if you don't charge them up and they go dead, you can hit the button just for a second, the light to come back on after a little bit, but just that quick, buddy, it's gone. Amen? What I'm saying this morning is um, you've you're, you're, you got to be recharged sometime. We have to be recharged. Y'all agree? That's why God said we work during the day or vice versa. If you work day shift, night shift, just work with me a little bit. Don't hold me to the fire. What I'm saying is we work during the day and we sleep at night. You see, God said you've got to recharge. You have to refuel. That's what we have to do. And so what God is saying is this morning is we have to light, light it up. We have to light it up. But guess who recharges us? When Jesus comes into our life, he walks into the room. He charges you up. He actually makes your light shine. Let's look at the plan of salvation this morning. Look at Romans 3.10. You ready? Y'all got these verses? We're going to make note of these here. <clears throat> And I tell you what, just be mindful. Imagine your kid this morning or your future kid this morning or the closest person to you, and you have to know this in order to lead them to Christ. Remember this. It may come to be very important one day. But Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not. Here's what he said. God is saying this morning that there is none righteous. So what we have to do is understand that we are the same. See, there's this persona out there that there are some people that are better than other people when it comes to being spiritually. So we have to understand that Romans 3.10, there are none better than others. We spoke about this recently, but have you ever run into any Christian that you, that you think that they have this idea that they may be more spiritual than you? Have y'all ever seen that in your life? Yeah, all right. They don't get out a whole lot of it, you know. That they out there. That, that, that it happens. And so I want you to understand that that, that there's nobody better. What Christ is trying to say is there are none righteous. 
there are none righteous. So can I say this here to you today? There is nothing you nor I can do. If you, if you go to church every Sunday, if you pay your tithes every Sunday, if you teach a class every Sunday, if you usher every Sunday, if you, do, if you clean this, clean, nothing you do can make you righteous. Because here's what Isaiah said. Your best is as filthy rags. Now, I've often wondered what my worst looks like. Because if my best looks like filthy rags, then it can only get down from there. But what I'm saying is, but God is saying that it is not what you do that makes you righteous. I could preach, you know what, Billy Graham? None of Billy Graham's messages were ever righteous because of him. Never one time did Billy Graham do anything righteous. Never. Other than accept Christ. Billy's righteousness was because Christ is righteous. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do. And see, what God is trying to tell you is a lot of people don't get saved because they don't think they're good enough. They don't think they're like somebody else. And see, that's a problem. And what you have to understand, and then we have to understand on the flip side as believers, don't give people the image that you're better than them. Now, I've often said this here, and you can write this down. We're not better than somebody that's lost. We're just better off. That makes sense? We're not better than anybody who's lost. We're just better off. And so, there are none righteous, no, not one. N look at the second thing here, Romans 3.23, plan of salvation. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. You see what Jesus is doing? He's trying, and this is what you have to understand this morning, if you're not saved and you need salvation, or if you're here this morning and, and you are saved and you want to share the plan of salvation. See, this goes both ways. So please take this in this morning. But see, what he's saying is that we've all sinned. We're all sinners. Did you realize that this house right now is just full of a bunch of sinners? Everybody in this house, starting with me, is sinners. Everybody outside these walls are sinners. And so what we have to understand is he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you know what that means? You know how a lot of people, this is the problem with people in their mind. There's a, maybe some people here today or some people listening or watching live. See, you think because you've lived a pretty clean life, you're a good person. Goodness don't get you into glory. I've never heard that goodness puts you into glory. I heard that God puts you into glory. That's the only way we can be put into glory is through God, not by your goodness. Now, there ain't no difference but in one O. Oh, but what I'm saying is you don't want to get to heaven and then say O. Oh. So what happens is, you get right here now, and, and he's saying that, look at the last part of verse 23, and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have done that. So don't ever think for a minute just because you didn't curse a whole lot, you didn't do drugs. I mean, there's some people in here who, believe it or not, can say, I've never smoked reefer. Y'all think that's a joke? Y'all don't think there ain't nobody here who can say that? They, 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 there's people in here who can say they have never drank alcohol. There's some people who, who can say in here they ain't never swore in all their life. There's some people in here who can say they ain't never gambled one day in their life. There's some people who can say they've been in church all their life. There's some people who can say that they've read their Bible every day of their life. But that don't make you saved. That don't make you righteous. What I'm here to tell you today is when your heart stops beating, it's too late. Or when, that, when Jesus comes back and that trump sound, it's too late. Remember this here. That trump's not going to sound long enough for you to say, oh, God, please forgive me my sin. You might get an O out, and that's it. But it's, it, it'll hit you before you ever know what happened. What he's saying is, is we have all come short of the glory of God. Now, watch what Christ has done in these two verses here, and we'll move to the next one real quick. He has leveled the playing field. He's telling you, he's saying, 
I don't want anybody to feel like they've got this spiritual status or this status. What Christ has said, there's none righteous, no, not one. He's saying that we've all come short of the glory of God and we've all sinned. You see what Jesus is doing? He's just putting it out. And you have to understand this morning, if you're receiving it, planning to give it, that Jesus is leveling it. So when you're talking to somebody, you're explaining it to somebody, please let them know what Jesus is trying to do through these two verses. Then you get over to Romans 5, 8. Look at that. <clears throat> Romans 5, 8, he says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Anytime I've led anyone to Christ, this verse right here begins to really move within them. A person cannot begin to understand why somebody would die for them even though they were lost in their sin. It's just like saying, how can a mama love a child who, who is out there just living like a hellion, going on and doing whatever they want? How can a mama love a child like that? I mean, why? It's because there is a love there for that child. And apart from that, they wouldn't be able to do that. It's the love. It's the connecting piece. But, but get this for a moment. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what that means is Christ died a long time ago. Do you know that was Christ died long before you were ever born? But the Bible says that when he died, he died once and for all. And once, once means he died one time. That'll never happen again. And see, and that's where so many times we understand that if we're lost in our sins, then this morning that we should understand that Christ died for us all because he loves us. And what that means is that if Jesus died then for what you're doing now, that his blood and his sacrifice is more powerful than any of the sins you have ever committed or ever will commit. Ever will commit. And so then you have to understand that what you've done, this is where a lot of people say, well, preacher, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. No, but obviously he does because he died for it once and for all. And so what he's saying is no matter what you have done, the Lord forgives you. And, and, and let me tell you why you have a problem with that. If you have a problem understanding that, it's because you are not a forgiving person. See, you have a hang-up thinking that somebody can forgive you of all your sins because you got a problem forgiving people for their sins. You see what I'm saying? You can't relate. But now, if you're a very forgiving person, then you can say, well, wait a minute, I could almost see why Jesus could do that because I see the forgiveness in me. And so then you begin to understand that Jesus is saying, yeah, but I, I commend my love toward you. What he was saying was, I loved you when you were unlovable. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus loves you no matter what condition you're in this morning. It don't matter if you are a dirty, rotten scoundrel. It don't matter this morning if you got drunk off your rocker for you got here this morning. Somebody done shot a needle in their vein. Somebody's over here telling you. It does not matter this morning. It don't matter where you've been, what you've done. Jesus died for you in your state of condition. And Jesus said, I love you so much, you're still worth giving my life over. And I just want you to be able to have the choice and the opportunity. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, that'll make you about get bubbly inside and get goosebumps where you didn't think you could get them. And then you're sitting over there praising the Lord because no one that, think about it. Jesus died for your children. Jesus died for your mama, for your Jesus died for you. Jesus died for all the people in the world. This plan of salvation works because this man had a plan, and I want you to know this morning that it is that plan of salvation, knowing this morning that he loves you. So what happens then is because a lot of times you'll get this rebuttal. People will tell you, well, I'm not good enough. Well, I've done this, I've done that. And you just got to say, listen, it don't matter. All because of what Jesus did, it doesn't matter. Now, what if people could forgive like Jesus could forgive? What? Look on at this here real quick. We don't want to spoil the moment. Look at, look at Romans 6, 23. Look at this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. Notice this real quick. You got two paychecks in life. You got one check that 
Both of them are going to be equivalent to wages. All right? We all like to get a check. Amen? I mean, it don't matter if it's a check in the box, a check in the mail, a direct deposit, or a check by our name because we did good. Everybody likes a check. What he's saying is you got these two checks here, and one check in this envelope says death. The other envelope says life. And the choice is ours. He says here in this verse, look back at it again. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So powerful, he says. God is saying this morning that, that and when he promises this, notice this here this morning. You have eternal life. What would it take for me to be able to convince you this morning to know that you got eternal life in your body. That there is a foreverness in you. A foreverness in you. That you're not just going to live in this life, but you're going to live in eternity. And not only that, but you're not going to die the second death. We done overcome that. Come on, church. We, we done overcome that. There ought to be some gratitude in this place this morning. A little bit of thanksgiving, amen. That's good stuff. I mean, we, so we are talking about us. We're not just talking about somebody else. And, and, and so what happens now, watch this here. Look over here. And, and this is where Jesus now gets into the place here where he's saying, okay, this is where it becomes the part of the individual to, to make a choice. Here's, here's where you have to understand. He, watch, he's, he's leveled the playing field. He's leveled everything out. Nobody's greater than anybody else. Everybody's here we are. He gets over here, and then he begins to start taking it to the point to where he says, okay, now watch this. No matter what condition you're in, the love of God has now made a way. That's what Romans 5, 8 says. Then he says, now you are confronted with a choice. You've got a decision to make. Now it becomes, and this is what I love about the Lord, because there's so many people out there, and perhaps in here, think they're just going to go to heaven all because of what Jesus did. Man, I'm telling you right now, if I could be quite frank with you, there, by what the Bible says, there are going to be so many more people burn in hell than will ever go to heaven. Just know that. I hate that. That sounds terrible. But sometimes you've got to get it raw for it to make any sense. you just got to get it raw. But I'm telling you, a lot more people are going to miss out on heaven. A lot. So don't tell me just because what Jesus did going to get you there. No, and you're right. Jesus ain't never, never going to send you to hell. No, you're exactly right. You sent yourself. He did his part. He's not going to send you there. You're sending yourself. So you need to understand that that's very important. And yeah, God is love, but also at the same time is God can't lie. So when he told you in, your, in the word this is what's going to happen, he can't lie. It's going to happen. And so now watch here. He gets over here, Romans 10, 9. Let's look at this real quick. He says, <clears throat> Romans 10, 9, he says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hey, listen to me, church. This, 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 is, this is where it comes down to it, right? So like, um, all right, so it's kind of like this right here. This is always a good, simple way to know. Ready? If, if you have never, ever, if you cannot remember, now listen to me, now this, this will make a difference in your eternity. If you have never, ever been saved, and what I mean by that is this. You don't have to remember what words you said. You don't have to remember what color T-shirt you had on. You don't need all that. You don't need to know the date. But what I'm telling you is if you do not recall a moment when you met Christ, and I'm talking about you were convicted and you knew something wasn't right, and come to find out, it, it doesn't have to be in a church, though. It don't have to be at an altar. No, 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 no. Truth is, more people should get saved off that altar than on that altar. More people should get saved in between Sundays than on Sundays. 
The church is not doing its job if people are not getting saved in there during the week. I mean, that's a direct result of that. If we rely on Sunday, we're relying on somebody else to do our job. But what I'm saying is, if you cannot recall it, listen to me now, I'm not talking about what your mom and daddy told you what you did when you were little. Your mom and daddy, I love them, you love them, God bless them, but they're not going to get you into heaven. They ain't got one say now. When they get to glory and they stand there, they just glad they got there. They're not going to get you in. They're not going to go over there and say, hey, Jesus, will you do me a favor? No, no, no. They don't work that way. There's a righteous judge, and he's looking for one thing. He's looking for the blood of his son to be on you. And if it ain't on you, now get this now. If it's underneath your feet where you walked on it and disrespected it, you'll keep on stepping. Now just don't, don't please understand, don't say just because you got blood on your hands or blood on the bottom of your feet, that ain't going to get you into heaven. Truth is, that's a ticket to you know where. Because you misused and mishandled the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't do anything more dangerous in your life than to mess with the blood of his son. If you want to mess around and get messed up, man, I'm going to tell you right now, you want to be able to drive from here to the fork of that store, your brand new car will be broke down 12 times before you get that mess around with the blood. Jesus Christ don't play that. But what I am telling you this morning is, if you cannot recall a moment, and get this here, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and break some hearts this morning. Ready? But, I, but I'm telling you this because I love you. Just because you got christened when you was little, they can't sprinkle enough on the outside of you to clean your inside. Ajax can't get that off. So I hope to God you ain't sitting here relying on a sprinkle. I mean, a sprinkle won't even help a crop. Amen? Amen. That ain't going to get it. A, a christening, somebody bathed you in holy water? That ain't going to get it. Anointing oil ain't going to get it. So I hope to God you ain't sitting here talking about, yeah, my mama told me I got baptized when I was eight months or two years old. I think that's a great thing. But that is not your ticket to glory. They ain't nowhere in the scripture says that's acceptable in the sight of God. Yes, we anoint. Yes, we christen. Yes, we do those things. But for God's sakes today and for the sake of your eternity and for the other people you teaching and training, this false doctrine, you need to change that. Because you'll be responsible. That's when you'll get the glory and the blood of Jesus Christ will be on your hands because you mishandled the blood. There's only one way to get the glory. And that is to ask God to forgive you of your sins and acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior. And the word for that is total depravity. You cannot save yourself. You cannot give enough. You cannot do enough. You cannot think enough. What he's saying is the only way that you can be saved is to receive and accept the finished work on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and knowing that he rose early that morning because his father woke him up and because he lives, you can live. And when you ask and call upon him, as he says in the next couple of verses, he says you got to confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. And he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You better believe one thing. I'm not your judge. I am not your judge. And I'm not even worthy to hold this book. But I am, I am of the understanding that if you don't know this book now, then you needed to know it today. And you know what this should accomplish? Two things. Three things. One, this morning, there ain't a doubt in my mind that there's somebody here who needs Christ. There's not a doubt in my mind that there's somebody in this service right now that God is dealing with their heart. No doubt. 
what would be the most awesome thing in this, this morning is for, for one of us to be able to help lead you to Christ this morning. Church, will we be glad to do that? Number two, the Christian should, thank you, the Christian should be, the Christian should be very thankful. There should be a heart of gratitude this morning because of this salvation. But there also should be a challenge and a call on our life to not wait on a Sunday or wait on a preacher or not even have to necessarily wait till you get your Bible to be able to lead somebody to Christ. Truth is, your, your Bible's a great tool. Not saying anything about that, but don't wait on a Bible and miss an opportunity of leading somebody to Christ. Don't wait to Sunday. Don't wait to Sunday to do that. But lead that person to Christ. Church, let me ask you a question. You, you've been saved, amen? Do you know the gospel? I, I don't hear, I'm not as convinced about the second one as I am. It sounds like you're saved. But, but, but you do understand, learn this this morning, church. Learn this. We talk about the gospel enough around here. You should know it inside and out. And you should know where it's at in the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, will give you one of the greatest biblical definitions of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Write it down. Memorize it. And this is what it comes down to. Jesus Christ came. He died. He rose. And, and you know, and you know what's, you know what's tough. You know what? Let me tell you what. You want to tell you what I did? I get vulnerable sometimes. I smell a cake. I want to. Eat. I get vulnerable. But let me tell you something. Sometimes, walk with me just a minute. Ready? Sometimes, I'm not convinced that the Word of God is as powerful as He says it is. And you know what makes me doubt that? People, people, I'm a preacher of the word this morning. I'm no different than you are, I promise you that. But I'm not convinced this morning that the word of God has the power that he says it has. Mm -mm. I'm just not convinced. That's good, I like that. I'm just not convinced. Because he told me that when Jesus' name was preached, when his name was lifted up, that it would draw people unto him. He told me when Jesus' name was spoken that demons could be cast out. I mean, honest to goodness, you think about it just one second, and you judge yourself. Have you shared Jesus' in an attempt to win somebody to Christ since the last Sunday we met. We should be sharing everybody, every one of us. Not just a few, all of us. But you know, but that's why God puts it in our life so we can do that. So that we can actually go out and do that. Church, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm going to just tell you this right here, and I'm telling you this, this would be the easiest thing in the world, and you and you think that I'm crazy, and you have since I've been here, but that's okay. I mean, I don't blame you, but I can tell you it's produced results. I don't see failure here. I see success. So call it crazy. Call it what you want, but I see success. But I'm going to tell you this. All we'd have to do is walk out of this place today, and I'm telling you it would be just this easy. Ready? If you would accept the challenge and walk out of this place today, I don't need your money. You keep your money. Burn it in a barrel. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Give it to the Antichrist when you see him. I don't care what you do with it. Keep your money. I ain't talking about your money today. You keep your precious money. But what I'm telling you is, you take that word of God that's been given to you freely, that's bought with a price, you take that word of God and you carry it out to those people. And I'll guarantee you, in a month's time, in a month's time, 
you won't be able to fit the cars and you won't be able to fit the people in this place because they'll be standing in room only and they'll be standing outside the doors looking through the windows. Because there is a world out there that is hungry and has an appetite for what you've got. You know why? Because they don't get much of it. They get the scraps that we leave when we leave the tables or drive from here back to the house. Because after that, the gospel gets turned off. They hungry and they dying for what we've got. God has given us something that is unlike anything else in this world. Now, you expect me to say, but, but for God forbid, you get one of these children or get somebody just out of the ordinary to get fired up about Jesus, you get fired up. And all of a sudden, it'll inspire you. So please, please, if God is speaking to one of our young people this morning, I know we've got to close, we've got baptism and all kind of good stuff, we'll be back at the night at 6 o'clock and everything else in between. But what I'm saying is, get, get fired up. Be the one. Take the message. Take the message. And what happens then is you get over here and you start carrying that out there because Jesus said, do you believe there's still power in the word? But we got to work it, right? I mean, I believe a treadmill can help you, but you got to get on it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I mean, God, you can see, I think the word of God can help anybody. I know but you got to get in it. You got to go do it. But I'm telling you this morning, let's close like this right here. Ready? This morning, not based on what anybody else has ever told you, but can you say this morning? Because, you know, truth is, this is where it starts. There ain't no going outside these walls unless we got it right in here. This is our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It starts in here. So, who in here this morning don't know Jesus? Because the doors are locked and you ain't leaving until you made him. If nothing else, introduce him and, and, and watch this now. Ready? Listen to me just a second. Let us introduce you to him, and then I want you to clear your throat just as much as you can, and I want you to spit something in his face like it's never come out your body before. Rear back and slap him if you want to and snatch his beard out. He's seen your kind before. He's seen your kind before. But you didn't stop him. You didn't stop him. You can't stop him. But that's what I want you to do this morning. Everybody in the house meet him this morning. And you greet him how you want to greet him. If you want to hug him and love him, hug him and love him. If you want to spit in his face and pull his beard out, then you'll have to go through me to get to him. But that's fine. Because he is my Lord and Savior. You can talk about my mama. You can talk about my daddy. You can talk about my children. But don't talk about my Jesus. This morning, meet him, and you greet him how you want to. He has seen all of our kind before. But he still looked up to the Father and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God asked, for forgiveness for everybody who ever hit him, ever cursed him, ever spit in his face, ripped his beard, pierced his side, beat him like a dog at a stake, he said, I still love you and there ain't nothing you can do to stop that. Hallelujah. And here we are today, loving it and living it. And God has given us a message that we can carry out. He said, let me tell you something. I died for it and I live for it. There's nothing more powerful. Nothing that can open more doors. Nothing that can set the captive free. Nothing that can deliver the person from bondage in their life. Nothing that can give them more.
joy in their life, put a smile on their face. But for God's people to be excited and be encouraged and stand together in unity, realizing that we are of one Lord, one spirit, one faith, and that God said that we will unite together and take this very simple message to the ends of the earth. That when Jesus is lifted up, he will draw all men unto them. There'll be salvations. There'll be people getting saved you never thought could get saved. There'll be people getting rededicated you never thought could be rededicated. And people get together and start praying. And every little problem begins to start diminishing and fading away. And then we come together and understand it was all because of the gospel message that we had. And all we had to do is stand up for what we believe in.